So John, the second chapter, verses 13 through 22, I'm going to read it. And it says, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, When he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them. And they believed the scripture and the word. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. And today we're going to talk about overcoming. Time to clean the house. We are preparing for 5783. Amen. Let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord God. We bless you, Lord, and we praise you. There truly is none like you. Father, I thank you for you truly do sit high, Lord God, and you look low. But Father, even in looking low, you shouldn't have to look low for us because you have given us access. Your word declares that we are seated in heavenly places where all things are under our feet because you have given us that access. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I praise you, Lord God, for being able to step above all the things that try to hinder, stop, block us, pull us back, derail us, cause us to question who you are that you have given us dominion. Father, we are dominion heirs, Lord God. Father, we are to dominate, to subjugate, Lord God, to rise up and, Father, to fight the good fight of faith, knowing that if you be for us, God, that you are more than the world that would be against us. And, Father, in the name of Jesus, we trust in you with all of our heart. We lean not to our own understanding. In all of our ways, we acknowledge you, God, knowing, Father, that you're going to direct our path. So through this word that has been penned, Lord God, as I sat and I studied and I listened for your voice, give us direction. Give us understanding. Let us know exactly what it is that needs to take place in order for us to accomplish the goals that you have given us. Father, to help us to become who you designed us to be. And in Jesus' name, Lord God, for you to build us up. I thank you, Father, that we are greater and stronger together. And Father, we will work with those who are working with you. So there will be no division among us. And Father, we are ready to take this world by storm. Your word declares the kingdom of heaven suffered violence but the violent take it by force. So we bless you, God. We praise you and we thank you. We glorify you and we honor you in Jesus' matchless and mighty name. Come on, every saint with shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on again, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, charge this atmosphere. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah and amen. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Father. This morning I woke up with an idea in my mind of what was going to be shared with each and every one of you today. 
and I had this whole sermon prepared to preach, and it was getting ready to be a wonderful thing. I was stepping in, stepping down, stepping on, stepping through the whole nine yards. I was ready to fight the enemy that was at war with your soul. I was ready to rise up and slay any dragon that would come against you in the name of Jesus. But God said there's something that they're missing. So I was ready, but my team is unprepared. And I said, okay, so what do you want me to do? And so I sat still, and I sat and I waited to hear his voice. And everything that was penned, all the notes that were in my phone that would be translated into a sermon, had to be pushed to the side for now so that we could prepare for what is on the way. I've got the answer for what's on the way, but we got to prepare the foundation before we make our way in that direction. Are y'all with me on today? Hallelujah. And so when I opened up my phone, I usually go and see what the Lord is saying through other prophets. And the reason why I do that is because you don't want to get caught out there hearing things by yourself. There's so many people who just go off of only what they hear and that's it. Usually God will send an echo in the spirit. When I got here on today, I was looking for that echo in the spirit. And they gave it to me through song, through prayer, through O.C. sharing about his grandmother, through everything that went forth prior to me, even Kamika, talking about the youth that was on the team, lined up with what God gave me while I was sitting at home. An echo. We call it a confirmation in the church realm. But there is no word called confirmation in the Hebrew. It's an echo in the spirit. So what's happening is God is sending out his word and we're to hear it. But as it comes back, until it accomplishes what God has assigned it to do, it'll never go back to him void. Are y'all with me today? It'll never return back unto him void. But it will strike the mark and accomplish that which he sent it to do. And it will prosper in that thing. So that word continues to circulate among us until what? It accomplishes what God sent it to do. So I should be able to hear an echo. Because what happens is we go out there and we've heard from God once. We've heard from God twice. And then that's all that we rely on. But there should be something that raises up in your spirit that says that something is off. Something isn't quite connecting. I can't see how this that I'm hearing right now connects to that which he's already spoken to me. How does one thing complete the other? There needs to be a continuum. Are y'all with me on today? In order to be able to get from one place to the other, if I was making a map to go back home to Akron, Ohio, I'm not just going to go out there and just start driving and hope that I get there. I'm literally going to map it out and I'm going to know where to turn. I'm going to know when to get off on another expressway or another freeway, another highway, whatever it is that you want to call it. I'm going to know where it is that I'm supposed to stop because I've arrived at that location. But notice when you're driving from one place to the other, you're going to take a straight shot there. There is a continuum. It doesn't stop. Everything that you do builds upon the next thing to get you where? To the end result, to that location that God is sending you to. And it's the same thing in the realm of the spirit. So this morning when I got up, I looked at the meditation through uh, Bill and Marsha Burns. And this is what Bill said this morning. It said, stay focused. Stay focused. The winds of change are indeed blowing. Remember my words in 2 Corinthians 1.20. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him. Amen. To the glory of God through us. Amen. So be it. Let your amen make it yours. Somebody should have shouted right there. Therefore, trust me with your problems. Rely on me to fulfill my word on your behalf. Psalm 18 and 2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength and whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. 
And his wife came right behind with an echo and she said, break free from the things that have held you captive and kept you in bondage. It is time to deal with issues that have held you back and hindered your ability to become all that I have called you to be and to accomplish all I have set before you. Examine your life so that you can see clearly where you must fight for your freedom, says the Lord. Be courageous. And they ended it with John 8, verse 36, which says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So the Lord is looking for us to start to deal with some things on the inside of us, to start to conquer and overcome the things that have held us captive, that have kept us bound, that have kept us from moving forward in faith with him. Amen? Hallelujah. So on September 25th at sundown, we're going to celebrate Rosh Hashanah, which is next week. Now, this is also known as the head of the year or the Hebraic New Year. So what's going to happen is we're going to leave 5782 and we're going to cross over into 5783 on next Sunday at sundown. Hallelujah. So 5783 will be a year of celebration. But just like being in school naturally, each year is going to come with its new challenges. And one thing that I've learned is that it's so important not to just celebrate the prophetic words of new blessings, new beginnings, new cars, new jobs, new houses, new things, new stuff that's going to help you to get to the next place in prosperity that comes with each year. But we've got to learn how to stop and reflect on our own success. And we've got to recognize our failures from the prior year by looking at what the year was to be Mm -mm. and understanding how you got to where you are right now. You come to realize that your disciplines or lack thereof and how it plays into your current situation. We're wrapping up the month of Elul on the Hebraic calendar, which is a time of introspection and personal stock taking, asking ourselves if we've launched forward or have we fallen backward? What have we accomplished with the year that God has given us? What things have we done with the gifts and the callings that God has given us? Have you launched forward or have you fallen backwards? We must recognize that everything is not the enemy. What's interesting to me is that whenever something goes wrong, the first thing that we do is we say, let me tell you how the devil works. But what we never stop to think about is how is it that God works on our behalf when we begin to fight these different situations? There are some things that we choose not to face. We choose not to annihilate. We choose not to destroy. And those enemies will ride with us into our new place of habitation. It's a hard word. Oftentimes when I'm counseling, I hear a person say to me, when they're in the midst of a struggle, maybe I should just pack up and move to another state and have a fresh start. Well, that's fine and dandy, y'all, but understand that the problems that you are facing right here will not just go away because you move to another location. When you move from Des Moines, you are taking with you, you. So the same issues that you faced, the same lack of discipline that you had here, the same poor choices you were making while you were here, the same raggedy friends you chose to hang around, the same boyfriend or girlfriend who cheated on you 75 times, the lack of faith will go to each new place and cause the same issues in the new location until you decide that enough is enough and you choose to overcome, you choose to overtake, you choose to run over, to take down, to beat up, to destroy, Destroy and annihilate everything that comes against the promises that belong to you. People of God, we must understand that our successful completion of the prior year is what prepares us to take on the challenges of the new year. So we got to learn how to take this thing seriously. 
every year on December 31st, somebody comes with a whole new word and we jumping around and shouting until about January 5th. And then it's time to put the work in and we don't want to do anything. But here is God saying, my Hebraic calendar gives you a new year before you get to the Gregorian new year. Whew. Say this with me. I was born on purpose for a purpose and with purpose. Greater is he who lives in me than he that is in this world. Now put a praise on it if you really meant what you said. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now I know that everybody's looking for me to talk about what's coming in 5783, but I'm not going to talk about it yet because we need to make sure that we wrap up 5782 the right way. So if we look at last year, we learned that 5782 revealed a divine mandate for the body of Christ and a directive for his church. So what he did is he gave us the pattern. God gave us a blueprint so that we would know what the end is supposed to look like. I'm going to say that again. He gave us a pattern. He gave us a blueprint so that we would know what it is supposed to look like when we got to the end of 5782. It was prophesied right before 5782 transition. But have we accomplished the goal? Now understand, this is the same principle that they use in school. As you were growing up, they used the same principle. What they did is they would start the year off going over what was learned, and then they introduced the new concepts that provides the student with the potential to solve more complex problems. For instance, in grade school, you learn that 1 plus 1 equals 2. 2 plus 2 equals 4. 3 plus 3 equals 6, and so on and so forth. You learn things like greater than, less than. The kids are probably doing that right now. He's bringing the little, um, the little arrow looking, half of an arrow looking thing, and he's having to show which one's bigger and which one's smaller. Y'all should have caught that already in the spirit. Greater than, less than, turning fractions into whole numbers, etc. Each lesson prepares you to not only matriculate to the next grade, but it's preparing you to solve more difficult problems in the coming years. So by the time that you hit high school, you start taking on algebra running two, you take on geometry, trigonometry, some people can even take calculus, and it's the same in the spiritual as it is in the natural, y'all. This is why it's so important to understand what God is saying about each year prior to entering into it. But we've got to recognize what is needed to prepare us for success as well. Otherwise, just like a child who struggled in math in the first through the third grade, they will really struggle if we just pass them on. If they matriculate and they don't have the right support team to remind them that they can, to remind them and teach them at their level. Eventually what will happen, if someone's not there to speak life into them, they will eventually drop out. First natural, then spiritual. I remember we sent Bree to school. And what we did not know is that she had double astigmatism and that because of it, it changed the shape of her pupil. It was in the shape of a football instead of in the shape of a circle. So what that does is, when she's looking at words, it literally changes the shape of what she's seeing. Now, in reality, we can see that the letters look exactly right, but for her, a letter can form into a different letter because of the shape of her pupil. Are y'all with me on this morning? And so what ended up happening is, they started telling her once they found out that, you know, this was what the issue was, because at first they were saying, you need to hold her back. You need to do this. You need to do that. We don't think she's picking it up. Maybe she has ADHD. Maybe you need to have her tested. And I'm like, that's impossible. She can't have those things. And let me tell you why. I said, the reason that I know that she does not have those things is she can sit through Bible school she can sit through when she's in children's church and she can learn whatever it is that they're telling her. I said, but something obviously is happening with her eyes. 
And so we took her in, found out what the problem was, came back and gave them an answer to what they were trying to speak over my child. Had I have just listened to what they were saying, my baby would have been doped up, messed up, and would not have been able to complete anything. Because if you don't need the medications that they're giving you, it messes you up worse. But we got to take the time to seek the Father to find out what it is that he's saying. Instead of just taking the words of the lies of the enemy that's being spoken through someone who's in authority. So as she went back to school, we told them, here's her glasses. Now she can see. Her vision is not quite 2020, but at least the letter F is not turning into a letter L anymore. So now we got to start back over and rebuild the foundation. Because what was happening is she had been passed on from grade to grade and still was unable to complete what she was supposed to do back here in kindergarten. Recognize A, B, C, D. So now that she's gotten to a place where she's supposed to be picking up on things that are harder, picking up on things that are sight words and being able to say this is the, this is all, this is this, is this is that. She couldn't do it because the letters were changing form. But once we corrected her vision, hallelujah, somebody's vision is getting corrected in the house on today. Once we corrected her vision and addressed it and gave her the proper supports, she was able to read with no problem. But she still had to catch up. So here's the thing that tripped me out about this. So what they did is they said, okay, so we're going to put her on a plan. And in this plan, she's going to have support because She's going to need to be able to catch up to where the other kids are, and she's going to have to have somebody to help her to catch up quickly. Now, I didn't have a problem with that because I knew that she was missing the foundation. She had cracks in her foundation. And so I was like, okay, that's fine. But then one day me and Bree were going over her homework, and she said to me, well, this part is too hard, so you'll just have to do it for me. And I was like, excuse me? Last I check, I have my degree. This is not my homework, baby. This is yours. And I said, so we're going to try this again. And she was like, but it's too hard. And I said, but it's not. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And if you apply yourself, you can do it. Once you do it the first time and you overcome something that feels insurmountable, once you do it a second time, it becomes easier and easier and easier and easier. God wants us to be able to look at those mountains and speak to them. Oh, mountain, who are you but yet a mere mole hill in front of Zerubbabel? We got to learn how to not only teach our children, but teach ourselves the same thing. So I asked her, I said, baby, where did you get this idea? We talking about the lies that's being spoken. And she said, well, whenever I get to a place like this, all I have to do is tell the teacher, because she told me if it's too hard, just say. Excuse me? If it's too hard, just what? Just quit? Just stop? And you don't have to press to go any further? Here's what these people don't understand. They're teaching our youth this. And saying, because you're on an IEP plan, things must be too difficult for you. So you don't have to press through the difficult things in your life. You don't have to press through when things get too hard. You don't have to push on when the going gets tough. So what that does is it sets up a mindset. It sets up a stronghold that when any time anything gets too difficult, I don't have to press through it. All I got to do is ask somebody else and they'll do it for me. And if that was being taught to my child, how many adults do we have walking around like that today? I'm going to give you a whooping, Charlie. You see, I pulled my sword. It's out there on the desk now. It's right there. It's there. So that's what's happening. We've got people. When the going gets tough, it's too hard. They tap out. When the Bible tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, rulers of the darkness of this age, the only way to win a wrestling match is to either pin the person where they can't move anymore or they got to tap out. How many times have you tapped out because it was a little too tough? Because it got too hard instead of tapping into the one who can give you the strength. Tapping into the one who gives you the power. Tapping into the one who will help you to succeed. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. 
And this is why we couldn't get the other lesson. If we look at last year, we see where we've traveled from. But more importantly, we must understand where we are going and how what we've accomplished has prepared us to matriculate to the next leg of our journey. We got to stop and we got to know what was the stop? What was the block? What did I do? What did I not accomplish? How did I get to where I'm at? Because if you don't stop and look at the carnage behind you, you're going to continue to repeat the same thing as you move forward. So last year was 5782. Five is the letter hi. In the Hebrew, what that means is here is to be disturbed or behold. It also means revelations and grace. Seven is Zion, which means crown, weapon, or sustain. Eight is het, which means life or new life is coming. And two is bait, which means house. When we put the definitions together, it means the Father provided us that insight to help us understand our purpose for this year. He said, behold, I'm crowning you, my kings and priests, and providing you with weapons that will sustain you, bringing new life as we build a house for the Lord. So we learn that we're building a house for him, both naturally physically, internally, but also the house of God was to be built up. 1 Corinthians 3 and 16 says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? So we got to be sure that we are on the right track, but we got to look at the purpose of a temple to even understand if we're building according to the pattern. So number one, the temple was a place to meet with God. It was a place of worship, praise, and prayer. First natural, then spiritual. When you looked at worship today, was that what we were seeing? Or were we distracted? Were we playing around? Were we using our phones and texting and looking at Facebook posts? Or were we focused on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, telling him how much we love him? Telling him how much we thank him for waking us up this morning. Letting him know that we are appreciative of how he kept us through the night. How is it that you're starting your day if you are the temple of God? When you arrive, are you looking for God or are you looking for somebody in the temple to notice you? Are you walking in just to let everybody know I've had a rough week? We got this problem with having this spirit of Eeyore on us. Things are so bad and I need somebody to do everything for me. I can't do it. It's too much. I'm tapping out. And then we make sure our face is all twisted up so that people will feel sad for us. Y'all remember Eeyore on Winnie the Pooh, amen? How'd he do? Oh, it's a bad day. It's probably going to rain, y'all. Oh, Pooh, you probably can't do that. Everywhere he went, he brought that doom and that gloom with him. But yet here we are serving the most high God. Here we are serving the one who has already defeated the enemy multiple times. Here we are serving the God that can do anything but fail. <laughs> Understand that God visits his temples. And he's looking for us to be just like Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, this is our theme scripture, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And what he did is he said to them, I'm sorry, that's not our theme scripture. Our theme scripture is John, but I'm talking about Luke, Luke 2. Luke 2, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover in verse 41. And in uh, 249, he said to them, because what happened is Jesus' family came in, they celebrated the Passover. Now, let me tell you something about Passover. Passover turned into a drunk fest, y'all. They had wine that they had to drink every time they said something. They had this spread of food. And those who had the most money, what would happen is they would come in, they'd eat up all the food, they would drink up all the wine, they'd be toe up, and then the rest of the people wouldn't have nothing. 
Not everybody was to come to Jerusalem in order to be able to celebrate the Passover. There's three feasts that are celebrated by the Jews. And that is Passover, that is the Feast of Tabernacles, which is Sukkot, and it's also, um, Passover is what the world calls Easter, and then the um, Feast of Weeks, Shavuot. So there's three, and they would come, and they would celebrate them. So after they got done with the big party, enjoying themselves, having a great time, it was time to go back home. And so as his parents were going back to Nazareth, what ended up happening is they got good ways down the road. It's a whole caravan of them because they all traveled together, and they was like, is Jesus with you? I thought you had Jesus. No. Well, where is he at? And so they start asking the family members, all right, y'all keep going. I'm looking for my son. Is Jesus with you? No, he's not. Oh, is Jesus with you? Somebody needs to start asking who has Jesus with them. Who's in your circle? Is Jesus really with them or not? Because everybody that they actually went to, guess what? He wasn't with them. So they made it all the way back and where they found him at in 249 was in the temple of God. Now, what was amazing about it is here he was, this young boy. And he was sitting there, and he was amazing. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, the people who were still left in the temple, he was teaching them things that they did not know. He spoke with such an understanding that they sat, and all they could think is, dang, who is this little kid? Now, here's the thing that's a trip. When his parents got there, they was ready to choke Jesus, as any of us would have. His mama was like, boy, what was wrong with you? What are you thinking? Why would you do this to us? And he said, what are you tripping for, mama? This is the SMV. What are you tripping for, mama? Didn't you know I would be about my father's business? Now, here's what happened. Jesus set the pattern for the Sadducees and the Pharisees that day. He showed them what they were supposed to be doing, just as he has shown us, if we would read his word, what it is that we are supposed to be doing. The pattern and the blueprint has already been laid. Do we look like that, though? That's the question. My God. I told y'all this is a hard word. I ain't going to get no amens and no hallelujahs. That's fine. And, and so in John, if we look back at our, at our, um, our text for today, it says in verse 13, now when the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, I found it really interesting that both times it was the Passover. The Passover commemorated all of the crap that the Lord allowed to pass over the Jews. All of the mess that should have hit them. All of the curses that went to everybody who was not covered by that blood. They did not get touched by it. So John 2 and 13, Jesus came back during the Passover. And when Jesus showed up to the temple, he was actually looking for his father's presence. He was looking for worship of his father. He was looking for the people to be about his father's business, just as he was from a child. And in verse 14, it says, he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business as usual. When you came to church on today, did you come in for business as usual? Or did you come in seeking worship, praise, and prayer of the Father? So he found these money changers, he found these thieves, and they were just doing business as usual. What is it that he would find in your temple? If he visited you right now, what's he going to find? If he came into your house where you live, what's he going to find in there? But notice Jesus' response in verse 15. He made a whip of cords, y'all. He made a whip of cords. If somebody's making a whip of cords, that is preparation for a battle. Amen? You got to know where your battle buddies are. Know who your friend is and know who your foes are. 
Know who's going to help you to get the job done and know who's going to perpetuate the problems in your life if you're going to clean the house up. And then it says that he drove them all out of the temple. We got to stop and we got to identify what's not supposed to be in our temples. And we got to get together with the king of kings and the Lord of lords and begin driving these things out. When you drive something out, that is not a passive action. To drive something out means to cause, to compel, or to force someone or something to leave some space. What has been in your life that has been taking up mental real estate in your mind that needs to be driven out? What is it that has been in your life that has kept you from accomplishing what God has called you to do that needs to be driven out? What health issue is it that you need to raise up before the Lord and start to drive out by doing the things you know? will stop it from continuing and perpetuating. What is it that God needs you to drive out? Notice that he, he said he, he started driving the stuff out. He made the whip of cords, and he drove them all out. And then notice the next part of that sentence says, with the sheep and the oxen. He did not leave anything behind for the enemy to come back in and get to. Here's the thing. When I stopped smoking, one day I looked at the cigarette and I said, I'm going to quit smoking. I was tired of spending all my money. I was tired of the color it was making my teeth. I was tired of not being able to breathe. And I was tired of stinking because cigarette smoke stinks. And I said, okay, I'm going to quit. I looked at the cigarette, and I said, you know what? This cigarette does not have arms. It does not have hands. It does not have feet. It does not have legs. It does not have a mouth. It does not have a mind. So how is it controlling me? I decided I was going to take it over. I crushed the cigarette up, and I threw it on the ground. But here's the deal. Hallelujah. Here's the deal. I could not stop there. I could not leave evidence of being a smoker in my life or else it would have made it that much more difficult for me to be able to stop smoking. So when I went home, I went and I cleaned up and got rid of all the ashtrays. I went in my purse. I got rid of all the lighters. And then here's what else I had to do. I had to change those who I was around. Why? Because they would perpetuate the problem instead of help me to stop. Because they were enjoying what they were doing and it was time for me to stop. It was time for me to raise up and to understand the power and the authority that lied on the inside of me. So I had to change all of those things so that the enemy didn't have anything to come back to. As long as you leaving that old boyfriend that you're trying to walk away from, a pair of his shoes in your closet, a picture of him, of you and him together kissing on Facebook, guess what? Those spirits are still going to continue to come back through as nothing more than an avenue, an open door for the enemy to come back. He drove them all out, y'all, with the sheep and the oxen. The other thing he did is he poured out the changer's money. He did a quick work, which means that he was decisive about it. Y'all, I remember when I stopped drinking. You have to do a quick work. You can't do it in stages. When you are going to stop something, when you are going to make a change, it's all or nothing. So what people think that they can do is, what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly back away from this. So I don't have to feel the pain of not having it. When we fast, do you realize we do the same thing? When we fast, we start backing off the caffeine. We start backing off on all the meat that we're eating. Notice we use that same mindset. But what happens as soon as the fast is over, you go right back to your regular form of eating, bringing yourself back to the position that you didn't catch it, did we? When there should have been a change in your life, you found yourself right back where you began. Back to the same place. So when you pour something out, you got to understand 
To pour out something is a rapid flow. It's a steady stream. That means that you are letting it go until it's all gone. If we're going to pour out the money changes, if we're going to pour out the things that have held us bound, if we're going to pour out the things that have attacked our money, we got to let it go at a steady flow until it's all gone and it's broken in Jesus' name. And then after that, he got indignant about it. He started flipping their tables over. In verse 16, he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Don't make my father's house a house of merchandise. Have you taken that same accountability for your physical temple? If so, why do we have so many Christians who are overweight, you guys? We have no self-control, but yet we're trying to take on things that are way bigger and have been here way longer than we are. So in order for us to do that, we got to clean out every area of our lives, you guys. Every area. The second thing is this. The temple is a place for revelation. You got to know that God can and will speak to you. You cannot keep depending on someone to tell you every time that God is saying something. You have to get to the place where you know God's voice. If you are his sheep and he is your shepherd, the Bible says, my sheep know my voice and the voice of the stranger. They will not follow. And we have to recognize that it's both personal and corporate worship. So he's going to speak something to you that's personal to you, that is personal to your situation, personal to what you're dealing with, personal to things that have been in your bloodline. But corporately as a body, we have to learn how to move together as a whole unit, not siloed. We try to do everything individually. Well, I got mine. Well, I did this. Well, I did that. What about the rest of the body? If you got it, what do they do in school? If you already got the math down, they put you and pair you up with somebody else who's going to be able to help you to understand. Now what the teacher has done is grown herself or himself exponentially because now there's more than one person working in the room. My God. We got to know the difference between the voices, you guys. It's very important. James 1 verses 5 through 8 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. It didn't say just the pastor, the apostle, the prophet, the teacher. It didn't say that. It said, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting for he who doubts is like the wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind for let no man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double minded man and unstable in all his ways. And my last point, and I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to pick this up next week. I'm bumping you, Lachelle. I love you. The last thing is this, the temple is a place for unity among the brethren. Stand to your feet. If we are gonna clean up the temple, if we're gonna become the body that God has called us to be, we have to understand that there has to be unity, both personally as well as corporately, y'all. Personally, that means you can't have hatred in your heart for somebody that did something to you. Some of us are still carrying stuff from when we were five years old, six years old, seven years old of what someone did to us. Our mama or daddy who left us and was never there and we had to raise everybody and et cetera and all of that. But here's the thing. How old are you now? Your parents are only there until that day that they left you. So if they left you at 12, 13, 14, Guess what? If you 40 now, that's 20 some years. 20 some years that you have been in control of your own life. So we can continue to say it's because they did this and they did that. Or we can honestly look at the 20 some years that we've been alive. And remember I talked about greater than less than. Which one's greater, the 13 years that you live with them when they left you or the 27 years that you have been responsible for you? Huh? 27, right? Oh, nobody answered that question for me. I'll answer it. Hallelujah. 27 is greater. 
So if you've been responsible for you for 27 years and you've not gotten any further than when you were with them, where does the problem really lie? Does it lie with them and what they did to you? Or does it lie with you because you've not chosen to take the time to actually find out what the strategy is from the king and fix it and walk it out? I told y'all today was a hard word. I ain't getting no hallelujah, so now I'm going to read all 11 pages. (laughs) Hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah, y'all. Hallelujah. We're at the place, you guys, where it's time out for kindergarten church. We've been at this for a long time. And many of us have been in this house for a long time and should be leading by now. Amen? Not sitting in a position where you still need to be taught and taken in some milk. We're past that now. Hallelujah. And if we're past that, we need to be working. And our work should not just be among our own little family. Our work should be among the people of God. Do you realize how much work there is to do in this house? You ain't got to look for a mission field. It's right here. You show up every Sunday, don't you? There's a mission field right here. Say right here. There is a mission field right here that can be worked. Hallelujah. We have to understand, you guys, that we got to look at what we've done with this past year. And if we can't say that we're no further than we were when we started this year, last September, we got a problem. And the problem doesn't lie with God. He can do anything but fail. The problem lies with us. So I'm going to open up the altar for anyone who is in need of prayer. For anyone who actually is wanting to go past where they are. No more excuses. We're at the place where we are moving forward in faith, trusting in him with all of our heart, and leaning not to our own understanding. For those who are really ready to do what God has called us to do, I'm going to open up the altar. And if that's you, come on up. Just move out of your seat. Let's go. We're going to do this. Amen? Because it is time. It's time. Stop listening to the voices that say, oh, you're not ready. Oh, you're not this. You're not that. You don't know enough. Go read Jeremiah 1 and then come back and tell me that. Because Jeremiah tried it. Jeremiah said, I'm not not, uh, old enough. I don't know enough, God. And he says, I have placed my word in your mouth. It's all in what we choose to allow God to do for us that makes the difference in whether or not We are going to move from where we are. Now is the time. Say it with me. Now is the time. I'm not holding back any longer. And here's the thing, y'all. Pride. Watch your pride. Pride will keep you sitting in your seat when you know you're supposed to be standing up here. God's not letting us hide anymore. I have received a phone call in the last two days. And three people, now Grandma Barbara already told everybody she's battling cancer, but three people that we know are battling cancer. We got to fix this, y'all. People are in need. They're hurting. And it's time for us to come out of our little silly silos. That was the ride at Adventureland that spun you around in a circle until you were dizzy. We got to come out of our silly silos and move forward in faith with God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So no more going around in a circle like the children of Israel. But we're moving forward in faith in Jesus' name. So for anyone who does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, I know everybody in here except for one. And I'll be back there to meet you here in just a second. But for anyone who does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, if you want to give your life to Christ, today is a wonderful day to do it, to start fixing that foundation so that you can move forward in faith. If you know that you're called and you're not operating in your gifting and calling, come out of your seat. This altar is open, amen. 
Don't worry about what anybody else is thinking or saying. That doesn't matter because this is personal between you and Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're looking for a church home, we offer you New Beginnings Discipleship Ministries, a church that loves on one another, but we grow you up so that you can become who God has called you and designed you to be. He purposed you for something right here in the earth. Amen. You may not know what it is, but we are that kingdom purpose training center that's going to get you prepared to be able to take on all that God has assigned to you in Jesus name. So let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly father, we thank you. Lord, this was not an easy word to just chew and swallow, but Lord God, you needed to release this into the atmosphere so that we could begin to break up the follow ground that these things would not be able to carry into the new year. Lord, we want to prepare. So this week, we're going to take the time to fast. We are going to fast and we are going to pray. And Lord God, as we fast and we pray, we're going to set aside three days specifically for you. And as we set those days aside, Lord God, we're going to prepare ourselves to receive what you have for us. And Lord God, we're going to start to fight against those things that have stopped, blocked, and hindered us, clearing the pathway for the new blessings to come, getting rid of the old junk in our lives. So we bless you, Father. We thank you and we praise you. Have your way within us like never before. And Lord God, as we leave this place but not your presence, I ask, Father, that you would just order our steps, Lord. Order our steps, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord God, we love you, we bless you, we glorify you, and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.